Hello, I'm Adam Mayberry, and thanks for tuning in to this installment of Spotlight on Sparks. As the dirt turns, commuters are anxiously awaiting the Southeast Connector that will expedite traffic from Sparks to South Reno. It's a wonderful feeling today to be able to uh, see this equipment here and know that uh, very soon we're going to get started with this project. It was actually approved in 1954. So it's only been 58 years for this project to actually come to where we're going to start building this thing. The Southeast Connector is a new six-lane arterial. The high-speed road will include two new traffic lights at Mariloma Drive and Pembroke Drive. The $200 million arterial starts in Sparks at Gregg Street and Sparks Boulevard. And from there, it runs south for five and a half miles, ending at South Meadows Parkway and Veterans Parkway. The first phase is the construction of a bridge over the Truckee River. It's the bridge is, I believe, 1,500 feet long. It's not just a little bridge over the Truckee. It's a big bridge. That'll go in first. That'll take about a year and a half to build. And then, th then you'll see the road coming from the south connecting to the bridge. Spark City Councilman Ron Smith serves on the Washoe County Regional Transportation Commission. The RTC explains every road that's been built in this region since 1954 has been predicated on building the Southeast Connector. We're going to create 120 direct jobs for our construction friends, but I think more importantly we need to recognize this is a project that's going to add enhanced connectivity and mobility to our community. It's going to help connect Sparks to South Reno. Folks who live in South Sparks are going to have the opportunity now to get up here for shopping purposes, vice versa. Well, this is a perfect, uh, perfect project for quality of life. You know, it's going to take some traffic off the spaghetti bowl, it's going to give us another way to get people from Sparks to the south of Reno, where many of them work. West of 395, there are 13 roads for drivers to cross the Truckee River. East of 395, there are currently just three roads crossing the river. That squeezes 80% of the north-south traffic onto just 25% of the roads. That's the bottleneck the new connector will relieve. Like Bob Larkin said, 80% of the people work south of the river and 80% of the people live north of the river. So it's got to be another way to get people over there north and south, and this is a perfect way to do it. So if it's such a wonderful idea, why did it take a half a century to get out of the planning stages? Well, you know, there's a lot of uh, moving parts when you're looking at a project like this, especially when you have to interfere with the Truckee River. It's got to go over the river, so you got to appease the Corps of Engineers and U.S. Fish and Wildlife. Endow, and then the state of Nevada gets involved, and the county gets involved, and the city of Reno is involved because it's on their side, and the city of Sparks because it's on our side. So a lot of moving parts, a lot of people to get together and agree on one final project, and, uh, you know, that's probably why it took so long. Plus, it was kind of a controversial project, the way it was going through uh, Hidden Valley. There was different uh, different ways they were looking at doing this, uh, high, uh, the high road, the low road, the middle road. It was different ways they wanted to do it, so it took a long time really to get everybody together and sign the, the, the deal for one particular route through the valley. Highway design is complicated stuff. Engineers piece together a complicated puzzle of transportation and environmental concerns. Eventually, they come up with a project that meets most of everyone's needs. Respecting the natural environment is a part of every decision along the way. The geeky stuff we're very proud of at RTC is this road project is a model of sustainable highway design. We have gone to great lengths to make sure our footprint in the environment is a, is a, is a safe footprint from, a, from the environmental viewpoint. We've got a substantial amount of landscape restoration we're going to be engaged in. We're going to be protecting view sheds. We're going to be looking at wildlife crossings. We're going to be uh, including a multi-use bicycle path. Uh, so all of our users, all of our, uh, all of our users of our transportation systems, pedestrians and cyclists, as well as motorists, will be able to use uh, the Southeast Connector. Or... Uh, it's been one of my goals to dedicate uh, this bridge and the roadway to uh, the veterans uh, of this area. Uh, they already call it Veterans Parkway in the South Reno, so why not call the whole thing Veterans Parkway? That's the plan. When finished, the Southeast Connector will be officially named Veterans Parkway. It will be one of several ways our city honors military service. You may have already noticed banners bearing pictures of those currently serving in the armed forces decorating Victorian Square. That's thanks to the Blue Star Moms. Soon, Veterans Parkway will display plaques 
the Veterans Bridge in Sparks, that's special. We're going to put plaques up for the people that uh, gave the ultimate sacrifice for us. We're going to honor our veterans in this area. Sparks declared a state of emergency when the National Weather Service predicted the potential of flooding and high winds. City leaders activated emergency response plans well before the storm even hit the valley. We're the bathtub of the, of the valley, actually, so whatever happens upstream has to go through us before it goes down the river canyon. Assistant City Manager Steve Driscoll is one of many city leaders called in to staff the Emergency Operations Center. We actually have one here at City Hall, and it gives us computer systems and telephone systems and radio systems and people dedicated to specific operations. We have an operation, a planning component, a logistics component, and the fourth one is finance, always about the money at the end of the day. So our accounting people keep track of everything that happens so that when it's all done, we know what we spent. The team working here focuses on saving lives and property. We've been very concerned and we've done an awful lot of effort for flood preparation as best we can. But we've taken upon ourselves to plan a couple of projects to make things better specifically for our industrial area because frankly they're the ones that suffer the most. The city works under the National Incident Management System, NIMS, and that structure is used by every organization that has emergency management. So when I need help, it gives me a way to ask for the help and a way for the people that I'm asking to provide that help to me. So we would start here in City of Sparks. If we get overwhelmed or are, we can't keep up with what we need to do to keep working for the people and protecting property. We then have the ability to ask the county to help us. We can talk the same language. We know what we're doing. If the county is not able to help us because they're already busy, we can go to the state. When you're in the middle of a disaster, time is everything. And so if you're not losing time in communications because you're not having to define terms or define what it is you're asking for, that's getting the resource that you need out into the field, protecting the people, protecting their property, and you're minimizing the amount of damage that's happening to the city and its environment. Back in 1997, we weren't structured this way, and we really learned from that flooding event. The 1997 flood devastated the Truckee Meadows, leaving much of Sparks and Reno underwater. Since then, as part of NIMS, the city has developed a detailed flood response plan it anticipates problems and strategizes solutions before emergencies strike. One of the main problems we have is as the river rises, water pushes back up the storm drain pipes and pops up in the streets away from the river. So we've actually put some flood valves on the end of each of those storm drains. The city also has redesigned the North Truckee drain, an effort to avoid that bathtubbing effect. Another big improvement the city now has extensive GIS flooding maps to guide both its emergency efforts and its building codes. When the governor visited during the flood event this year, was, there were several things that were on his mind. One, since we had declared an emergency, there is the possibility that the state would have to step in, and depending on damage, either the state help us with funding and resources, National Guard helping us sandbagging, or the Highway Patrol helping us with evacuations, those things. He was here to get a, get a feel for what were we seeing, what were we planning for, what were the potentials. He also was making sure that we were working under the NIMS system, that we were organized in a way and we were following the plans. What it really does, it opens up the door for the City of Sparks to ask for help. The City is doing more than ever to keep you safe during emergencies. Under NIMS, the city now plans responses for 15 different emergency scenarios. To do your part, visit the Red Cross website and learn how to survive the first three days after a disaster strikes. Filling sandbags is harder than you might think. 
When people overfill bags or position them in the wrong place, they don't work. So work smarter, not harder. Here's a how-to on using sandbags. We see this a lot with all the bags that have been returning um, from this potential flood that we had. And people have been filling them up all the way to the very top. Um, it, it, it's too much work. When it's rounded like, like the bag down there to that size, you, there's a huge difference. So when you do properly put the bags down, uh, the bag over to the right there is too full. You want them about you know, three quarters to a half way down so you can take care of it and it's just easier. Here's the difference of what you will see and where you're going to have potential uh, water going through. Uh, what we want to do next is we want to make sure when you, let's say for instance like with this garage, you want to have them go facing one way, folded, stacked, and stomped. Um, that's the three basic ways of doing it. So you want to make sure that you fold it the right way, stacked, and stomped. So you fold This will be your next one And then you fold again And then you stack Some people have been doing it right, but some people they just don't know and they think just putting bags up and and doing whatever they can is the right thing to do it, but which you know they have the thought to do it right, but uh they don't really know how to do it right, so hopefully this will help out. For more information about using sandbags and station locations, please visit us online at cityofsparks.us. Keeping your car cleaner in the winter just got easier for Sparks residents. The city recently changed its procedures for maintaining snowy streets while providing a faster, cheaper, and easier method of keeping our streets clear of snow and ice. It's salt brine. It's basically just salt and water at a very high concentration. And the idea behind it is to pre-treat the roads with salt brine. When you do that, the salt brine is applied to the road. The water in it evaporates and leaves the salt on the road surface. That acts as a barrier when it snows or it gets icy or frost to any bonding with the road surface with the snow. An EPA grant pays for the cost of new equipment. The environmentally friendly brine treatment is a big improvement over the old salt and sand mix. So there's um, a lower cost associated with pre-treating the roads. Um, with salt and sand you have the mixing of it and then once you apply it, the EPA mandates that you have it picked up within one to two weeks. So that means we have to go back out and sweep it up. Um, salt brine is very cheap to produce. It costs us about maybe eight cents, a, I think it's eight cents a gallon right now that we're making it for. So we go out and apply it and you know it's it's applied to the whole roadway instead of spot spots like we would when we use salt and sand. But the uh, like I said, the associated cleanup is a lot a lot cheaper because you don't have to clean up salt brine. Once it's applied, there's no more man hours involved in main, in uh, cleaning up the salt brine. So how does the city prioritize which streets get treated first? I actually we had the drivers themselves the. Uh, more skilled maintenance workers sit down together and create maps on what streets they felt were a priority. They were reviewed by the manager and the supervisor of the department. And we came up with a set of maps with different areas for them. And priority ones, of course, would be Sparks Boulevard, Vista, Prater. We also do some around the school zones and some of the priority two streets like Green Bray and uh, Queensway, Bering Boulevard. When you see city crews working, Please drive safely and give them lots of room. We had the pleasure and honor to sit down and interview Sparks Councilman Ron Smith. Councilman Smith, thanks for coming on the program. Thanks for having me. Tell us how you first came to live and serve in the city of Sparks. Well, I grew up in the Bay Area and I moved up here in 1974. And I got, I've always been involved in politics or local issues, basically, and started out on the HOAs of a couple of different areas. And uh, it just escalated this, served on a couple of board of directors. And uh, this has been my passion, the city of Sparks, ever since I got on seven years ago. Now, I understand you also have a, a connection, a family connection uh, with the city of Sparks government. Why don't you tell our, our viewers a little bit about that? I do. My uh, wife's um, 
great-grandfather was Maris Parks. He served as councilman for 20 years. As a matter of fact, uh, Burgess Park is named after Seth Burgess. He was the mayor. Very good. Well, thank yeah. you. Tell the viewers a little bit about what some of your proudest accomplishments are serving the city so far. Well, you know, uh, I, this is, I'm in my seventh year now. Uh, I think the, the biggest accomplishments I have come through the RTC. I've been the chairman of the RTC for the past two years. And when I ran, initially seven years ago, I ran on three transportation issues. Vista Boulevard, the Southeast Connector, and Pyramid McCarran uh, Intersection. Vista Boulevard is already built and in, in carrying traffic. Indeed it is. I it, travel on it. It does. It's it very nice. <laughs> and the uh, Southeast Connector, which we're going to be calling the Veterans Parkway from now on, um, broke ground in December. They started drilling the holes for the 1,700-foot bridge across the Truckee, uh, I think, next week. And the Pyramid McCarran intersection is on its way. We'll, we'll be building that thing in a year. In fact, part of this program is dedicated to the groundbreaking of the uh, Veterans Memorial Parkway. Okay. So, and we had the, the biggest turnout of any any uh, groundbreaking. Indeed, that, that was yeah. uh, that was a pretty spectacular. It show. was. It was. Uh, that that project was approved in 1954. Is that right? In 54, and every road that's been built in this county since then has been predicated on the fact that this road will be built. It's going to alleviate traffic on Interstate 80 and I-580. What have you learned about the, uh, the government process and the bureaucracy, as so many folks like to call it? I mean, there's a perfect example of something that was uh, ready to go in 1954, and, and, and finally, through the, the process, we, we just broke ground, what, uh, more, than a, more than a half century later? Well, I, I think when somebody runs for office, they, they have a, a lot of um, high expectations of what they're going to get done. Um, they, it doesn't move quite that fast. Uh, you can get your... Get your uh, Whatever you want done, you can get done, but it takes a while because there's, you know, we are hard chargers. We want to get it done now and get it, but we can't do that. Um, there, there's too many people involved in everything we do, and not only that, government regulations. So, um, at the federal level, state level, all, at all levels of government? All levels. Yeah. And you find yourself working with our delegation out of Washington and the state people and, and the other cities, uh, the city council of Reno and the county commission. What can you tell us about uh, some of the other boards and commissions that you are, are currently serving on? I know you've played a, a significant role in the, uh, uh, the flood prevention efforts. I'm uh, the president of the, uh, of the chairman of the flood project. I've been that for two years now, and, and, and you know, we came close to having a flood last month, very close. Uh, it just it, it magnifies the, the, the issues this community has when it comes to flood protection. Uh, it's, been a, it's been a grind. Um, you know, the Corps of Engineers um, gets in its own way. They're, they're their own worst enemy when it comes to, to moving fast. Um, to get this flood project approved, it has to go on a word bill. That's just a white piece of paper explaining our project to the Congress. Um, in, in the last word bill was in 2007. There were 49 flood projects listed on that bill that were approved. Not one of them have been financed yet. So it's an uphill battle. Uh, and I'm sure that the people who live here don't really care about their, that we're, we're charged with providing flood protection. We really haven't done that yet, but we're working on it. Well, here we are in uh, early 2013. Can, can you summarize uh, the progress of the flood program so far? Well, I can tell you that the Corps of Engineers has spent $42 million studying our project. We've spent over $100 million acquiring land, uh, getting things in order so we can do this project. We, we, it was called the Living River Pro Plan. It went from 1.6 billion. It's down to about 500 million dollars now, uh, and basically, it's it's we, we're going to replace some bridges and and provide the, for the flood basin, uh, raise houses. Um, it, it's it's a comprehensive plan to prevent flooding this area. We will never prevent flooding, even if we had a 500-year flood event. I, I mean, protection it'll flood eventually. But what you're trying to do essentially is, is at least minimize it and, and mitigate it to the best that, that, that we can. So. No, and, and absolutely. And whenever you do a flood project, you have to protect downstream first because you, you, you get the water to flow through Sparks and Reno. You can't just give it to the people downstream. You have to take care of them too. So the, a lot of our efforts have been downstream. Let me change gears for a moment. Let's talk a little bit about the city. What, what is it in, in general that, that you would that you would tell people about about your city if you may talk with them throughout the state or throughout the region or in other states and other areas of the country what what comes to your mind when you talk about your city you know uh, and I tell people this all the time that I believe that they are in good hands with this council and, and the people who work for the city I'm proud of the people who work in the 
the city, not just the council uh, and the work that we do. We yell and scream and we disagree, but in the end we, we, we come to, a, we vote and then we, we support each other on that vote. Um, I, I think that the staff that works for the city supports us completely and they're the experts. We're just the elected people that pass the, pass the laws or, or whatever the projects would have come before us. We can make policy decisions, uh, the, the, yeah. the tough decisions, but, but you certainly right. rely on the support. I mean, that's what they pay us to do to make those decisions. But, um, you know, I, I think this city is progressive. I think we're doing very well in this economic conditions and I, I love it here. Do you have any long-term goals looking out, say, during your tenure on the council, however, however long that may be, looking out 10, 20 years, what, what, what's your vision of, of, of Sparks uh, for the future? Well, first of all, I think the Veterans Parkway will answer, will, will alleviate a lot of uh, traffic issues. That's big. And Kirkman, Karen, I want to get that done also. Uh, one of the issues that I've just uh, started with, and you're, you're aware of this, is the people in Sparks don't have a cemetery. I want to build a cemetery in the city of Sparks, and that's going to take some legislative action out of Washington. Uh, it's also going to have a, a veterans portion, um, and um, I'm very excited about that. I think that's 10 years away, but uh, we, we're just now, with the help of our staff, starting the groundwork on that. Tell us a little bit about uh, your family. Okay. Uh, you're married? I'm married. been married to, for, to Karen for 33 years. She's the boss. <laughs> I work for her. Um, I have four kids and eight grandchildren. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Do you all your, your children live in the area? They all live here. It's it's it's. I'm pretty blessed uh, and fortunate that they're here. And your professional real job is? I work for Scalari's. I've been in the grocery business for 40 years. It's a great story. 40 long years. Uh, 40 long. Years. Yeah. yeah. It's great. We well, do a good job and. Thank it's you. an honor having you on the council, and uh, we really appreciate uh, the time coming on the program and allowing our viewers to get to know a little bit of uh, Councilman Ron Smith, who represents Ward 3 in the city of Sparks, but uh, certainly all the members of the city council are elected at large during the general election, and Ron is a dedicated, passionate community servant uh, to our city. Thanks for coming to the program. Thank you, Adam. Thank you. That's all the time we have for this installment of Spotlight on Sparks. We sure appreciate your watching. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and even YouTube. And log on to our website at cityofsparks.us. Thanks for watching.